uh, actually doing a message. Uh, of course, uh, Wednesday is the 4th of July. I wanted to do an Independence Day message, and I really felt like the Lord gave me the story, a real familiar story that we all are aware of, the story of David and Goliath. And uh, look at that as a parallel for the independence uh, that we have in Christ. And uh, Israel at that time was under oppression and they needed, a, they needed someone to come and to rescue them, someone to come and deliver them. And God raised up David uh, for this point. And so I want to kind of look at this story, um, and there's, there's a lot of different levels where God delivers us. He delivers us on an individual level. He delivers us on a national level. Uh, and there is a battle that we all go through, and the same battles that you're going through today, believe me, are the same battles that are talked about in the Scriptures and the same principles that apply to those. And so the first thing we're going to look at is the fear that Israel was under. They were under tremendous fear. And in letter A, it says that the, uh, the enemy appears as a roaring lion. And so as we look at the fear that Israel was under, there's a lot of us that are dealing uh, with fear. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, do we got that on the screen? Oh, okay. Uh, Fernando will help you. There we go. Okay, so uh, chapter, uh, chapter 17, 1 Samuel. And, um, you know, it says that your enemy, as a roaring lion, seeketh whom he may devour. The enemy is as a roaring lion. He is not a real lion. He appears larger than life. He appears bigger than he actually is. Fear is the most powerful prison we live in. It dictates what you do, what you say, where you can go, what you think, what you believe. Independence starts in the spiritual realm and it manifests itself in the physical realm. The enemy's weapon of choice is fear. And fear must appear invincible in order to control you, to keep you imprisoned. Look at verse 1 in chapter 17. It says, Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sochus in Judah. And let me just kind of set this up for you. The Philistines had oppressed the Israelites. For decades, and they were under the oppression of uh, Israel was under the oppression from the Philistines. And the fact is that there were only two swords in Israel because the Philistines would not allow. We got it. The uh, would not allow the uh, uh, the Israelites to. Uh, have blacksmiths to be able to make their own weapons, to be able to sharpen their own weapons, uh, or whatever they had. They had to go to the Philistines to get their plowshares sharpened and to get all their equipment sharpened. They wouldn't allow them to make anything. So only King Saul and his son Jonathan had swords. Do you know, at the beginning, uh, while we were still colonies under England, England would not allow American colonies to manufacture things like furniture and other things. So if you can imagine, this is the exact same thing thousands of years later. Uh, you know, you cut some nice Georgia pine that you can make furniture out of or mahogany or whatever else you're going to make. So you get those trees, you put them on a ship. They take a two or three month journey across the ocean to England. They unload that... Uh, the lumber, they make the furniture, they put it back on the ship, it goes another two or three months back to uh, the colonies, and then they sell it. I mean, not very efficient, 
And what about the price on that? But that's the way oppression works. It keeps you uh, under this restraint. It keeps you under uh, this oppression. And so Goliath, he appears larger than life, and the Bible describes his imposing characteristics. Look at verse 4. It says, A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He could have been nine five, nine six. He was huge. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. And that's the equivalent of about 125 pounds. So you can imagine somebody wearing something that heavy and that big being almost 10 feet tall. He could have easily have been four, 500 pounds or more and chiseled. You know what I'm saying? You know, kind of like uh, Edwin in the back, but twice the size. You know what I'm saying? I mean, just absolutely huge. And so uh, he was an imposing figure. And his legs were bronze greaves and a bronze javelin slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bear was with, went ahead of him. Now the Bible goes into this great description about Goliath, this giant, and all the things that he had, uh, all the weapons of his armor and warfare. Why is the Bible going into detail because of that? You know, Goliath was infamous. Everyone knew who he was, that he was the giant, and he was like the devil, had the track record of killing men. And so he was imposing. And, you know, we don't like to say it. We don't like to admit it. But we are all controlled to one degree or another by what we see. Fear is about what you see. Faith is about what you don't see. So the enemy, he appears as a roaring lion. He looks larger than life. He wants to intimidate you. He wants to beat you before the battle even begins. And a lot of us, because of fear, it keeps us from stepping out, from taking a step of faith to do what God's called us to do because of fear. And we quit before the battle even begins. Most of the fears are built up in our minds and in our imaginations. A lot of the fears that we deal with aren't even real. You know, in psychology, they call it phobias. You know, people who are afraid of heights. Hey, you can go up into a tall building. People do that all the time. But some people are afraid of heights and they won't go to high places because there is this fear inside of them. It's not rational. Uh, people who are afraid of confined places, claustrophobic, uh, that fear that gets upon them. And it's really something that imprisons you. People who are ODC, ODC, you know, germophobes and things like that. Hey, you know, we understand about germs and washing your hands and doing all that, but some people take it to the nth degree and it becomes a fear. If you remember Howard Hughes uh, in the early 70s, he was one of the richest people on the planet, multi-billionaire. But the last 10, 15, 20 years of his life, he got this increasing fear of germs. And he literally imprisoned himself in a penthouse in Las Vegas. He wouldn't come out. It looked like his house looked like an ICU ward, you know, with everybody with a mask is and a mask on their face and the uh, uh, gloves and everything else and uh, all that stuff that was going on. And he literally, with all the money in the world that he had, he would not leave his house because he was afraid of germs. These fears can be unrealistic. Fear of failure, fear of rejection. People have fear of water. Uh, going out on the water. You remember if you watch the movie The Truman Show, you know, how did they keep him in his little island city uh, there? They made him afraid of water, to ever venture out on water. It's kind of interesting. I was watching a, a documentary 
on Jaws and Steven Spielberg, uh, who directed that and uh, produced that movie. Uh, he did such a good job, he scared himself to death. He would never go out on the water after that movie. He thought it was, and he really, he thought it was bad karma or something, and uh, he thought if he ever went out onto the ocean, the sharks would get their revenge. So he's actually, from the time of that movie, he said he's never been out uh, on a yacht or out on the water. You know, those phobias that just kind of come and they uh, terrify us, they imprison us. Israel was just hours away from its greatest victory, but it would not happen as long as they were held captive to fear. Do you see that picture? They're there, the battle is about ready to begin, and the fear was going to keep them from getting one of the greatest victories in their life and setting the nation of Israel free. You might be right on the cusp of breaking through in an area of your life, but fear is holding you back. Fear is keeping you imprisoned because of the things that are going on in your mind and imagination that the enemy keeps planting on you. How close are you to breakthrough, but fear is keeping you imprisoned from the hopes and the dreams that God has given you, but they will not be realized if we allow fear to control us. Our perceptions become our reality. When our faith becomes our reality, our reality will change. Our perceptions of life are going to change because it's going to be seen through the eyes of faith, not through the eyes of fear. Israel was already defeated, and they knew it, and they had not even fired the first shot. Let's look at letter B. Fear defeated Israel before the battle began. Let's look at verse 8. It says that Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? In verse 10 it says, Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Terror filled their hearts. Now what caused this fear to overwhelm the armies of Israel? Until you understand and define the fear, you will never overcome it. It will always control you, keep you under a leash, keep you in a leash, keep you from God's promises, keep you from the wonderful life-changing plans that God has for your life and for my life. What causes this fear? Did you see it? It was there in verse 10. On hearing the Philistines' words. As soon as they heard those words, a spirit of fear came upon them, and they began to tremble and quake, and they were overwhelmed. You can receive a spirit of fear and not even realize it. You know, there was a story, one of the great, great prophets of the Old Testament. His name was Elijah. And Elijah had come against the 400 prophets of Baal. And he literally called down fire from heaven on these uh, offerings that they had set up. It was one of the most amazing things that happened and killed all the 400 prophets of Baal. And so under the greatest victory of Elijah's life, Jezebel, the wife of the king, who was uh, you know, doing the Baal worship, she said that she was going by nightfall, make sure that Elijah was like one of the prophets of Baal. She was going to make sure that he was killed. And you know what happened to him? He received that word. Fear, fear terrorized him, and he went running in the desert. He was gone for months and months because the fear got into his heart. Now, this is a great, great man of God. 
a man of faith who spoke to God. Listen, if it's going to happen to Elijah, it can happen to any one of us. You receive a spirit of fear and it paralyzes you, it imprisons you, it keeps you from accomplishing what God wants to do in your life. It's not real, it's not rational, but in the spiritual realm, it is, it is there. And so they heard Goliath's words and they received it and they accepted it. On hearing the Philistines' words, they became terrified and afraid. And they heard Goliath's words, they received it. In 2 Timothy 1.7, it tells us, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. If he can create a spirit of fear, it's not God. If you are under a spirit of fear, you need to recognize that is not from God. Hey, you remember uh, last year when the, when the hurricanes were coming? And it happens every year. If there's a threat of a hurricane and it's out there and you go to uh, Home Depot, you know, you go to Publix or whatever, and you can just see this spirit of fear over everyone. I mean, they're rushing around, they're uh, cleaning out all the, uh, the food and everything else, all the shelves are empty. There is just, you can touch it, you, you, and you know what I'm talking about. Hey, you should not be under a spirit of fear. Well, that's what Israel was like. The whole army was under this spirit of fear. There was no way that they were going to be able to win the battle in that condition. We know how to train animals, and the powers of darkness know how to train us. Have you ever thought about that? Just like you train your dog, just like you train different animals, those powers of darkness are trying to train us. And one of the ways they train us is by that spirit of fear that comes upon us. And so we need to watch out uh, about those things. You know, in the, uh, in the circus, the little baby elephants, the way that they train the elephants is that they put a chain around them, they pound the stake in the ground, and the elephant can't pull out the, uh, the stake. And so he decides in his mind that that stake is too big, it's too powerful for him to escape, and for the rest of his life, he stays imprisoned by that stake even though he becomes three four five times the size and has more than enough power to escape he won't because he's imprisoned by his mind have you ever seen those uh, uh, dogs where they have the uh, invisible fence you know with a collar around their neck and they put it on the uh, the property lines and so when the dog runs and he gets a shock when he gets to the property line after a couple times he realizes I can't see what this is, but I can't go past it. And so you can turn it off, take the uh, collar off, and for the rest of his life, he's not going to go past the property line because he believes that something is going to shock him when he goes there. And so that's the way we train animals. And I want to tell you, those spirits of darkness are doing the exact same thing, trying to train us, trying to control us, by those powers of darkness. The Bible tells us that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers, authorities, and principalities in the heavenly realms. And we need to understand the real battle that's taking place. And we can only see it through the eyes of faith. Fear is a spirit, and you have to recognize it as such and deal with it as such and fear has to be cast out and it has to be replaced with faith. So let's look at faith in letter A. Faith sees the real battle. In order to win the battle against fear, you need the big three. You need faith, hope, and love. The Bible talks about having faith, hope, and love. Faith is the action of our hope and our love. It's what motivates, it makes us actually do those things by faith. In 1 John, it tells us there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. 
If you've got the love of God fully in you, it is going to cast out the fear inside of you. The Bible tells us that the righteous are as bold as a lion. Now, none of us would ever purposely go into a house that's blazing fire. We would never do that. We would be afraid, and rightly so, of going in to a house on fire. But if your child is in that house and trapped, almost everyone, every parent, would go in trying to save their child. What is the difference? The love for your child supersedes the fear of the flame and the fire. And so if you have the love of God, perfect love, His perfect love, it is going to cast out all fear. It's going to take those phobias uh, away, those fears out of your life. That's the only way to get rid of fear is to replace it with God's love, God's faith, God's hope inside of our lives. Perfect love comes in a relationship with God, spending time in His presence. We all want to have faith that moves mountains. But do we want to spend the time with the one who created the mountains? David was spending time with the one who created the mountains. This is what David said in Psalms 27. He said, one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. For in the day of trouble, He will keep me safe in His dwelling. David was a man who spent lots of time in the presence of God while he was working as a shepherd out on the shepherd fields. With all of that time he had with him, he was spending that time with God. Faith is not a commodity that you can buy at the store. You know, you don't go up to the deli and say, well, you know, I'd like uh, one pound of ham and I'd like one pound. No, make it two pounds of faith. Uh, I need two pounds of faith today. No, that is not something that you buy at the stores. Faith is something that grows inside of you like that mustard seed. It grows and uh, it takes over while everyone was given over to a spirit of fear. All of Israel were dismayed and terrified. David was not. Now the question is, why not? Why wasn't David given over to that same spirit of fear? I believe God's people, I believe that us, we are being sucked into the same spirit of fear today as the army was back then, thousands of years ago. Look at what it says in verse 16. For 40 days... The Philistine came forward every morning and every evening and took his stand. So he came out from the battle lines. He saw the armies and he starts yelling his defiance. He's telling them that you're not going to win. You can't succeed. You guys have no shot. And every day for 40 days, he was spouting his propaganda. He was spouting all of this doubt all of this unbelief on the people of Israel. And you know what they were doing? They were receiving it. They were accepting it. They were already defeated before the battle began. We need to convert our TV time, our internet time, a lot of our leisure time to more of God time. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because if we spend every day listening to Goliath's defiance on the radio as we go to work and as we come home on the nightly news and that's all that we're hearing, what's going to happen to us? We're going to receive and accept the same spirit of fear. I can't do this. God, I don't have the power to do this. Father, this is just too big for me. This is too big of an obstacle. This is too big of a problem in my life. If we spend all of our time listening to that, we are going to receive that same spirit of fear that will give us, and what will that give us? Will that give us more faith, or is that going to give us more fear? The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, 
So he is. So those things that you're receiving in your heart are the things that are really creating the attitudes, the thoughts, the strongholds in your mind. David showed up. When did David show up? He showed up on the 40th day. He wasn't even a part of the army. He was tending his father's flocks. He was a young boy, not old enough even to go into the military. And he shows up, and just imagine, here's this guy who's spending all this time with the Lord. He shows up on the battlefield, and what he hears from Goliath just absolutely shocks him. Listen, when you haven't heard something uh, that has been, you know, propagandized for time and time and time again, on the outset, it just shocks you. It's like, what is this nonsense that I'm hearing? And so David, he shows up, he was shocked. He had not been desensitized by Goliath's propaganda, his indoctrination, his brainwashing of the uh, Israeli army. His, you know, they just became mind-numb robots, uh, just sucking in everything that he said. We can't win. He's too strong. He's too powerful. We have no hope. That's exactly what was going on in their hearts and their minds. But you know what David said? He said in verse 26, he said, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He's looking at him and he's saying, This man is irreverent. He's unholy. There's no fear of God in him. David did not see what the rest of Israel was seeing. David was watching this drama unfold before him and play out through the eyes of faith. Let me tell you, faith will let you see things that other people cannot see. Faith will let you go places that other people cannot go. Faith will allow you to do things that other people cannot do. That's what faith does because fear imprisons you, but faith releases you from those prisons. And we need to be released from those prisons of fear that the enemy is trying to put upon us. Goliath thought he was fighting against flesh and blood. You remember what he said at the beginning? He said, aren't you the servants of Saul? He never mentions God once when he's addressing David or he's addressing the armies of Israel. He doesn't even think about the God of Israel. He thinks that this army is the army of Saul. How did David look at the army? He said, these are the armies of the living God. He recognized that this was God's people and this was God's army. And so he saw it in a totally different light. Satan or David, he never stopped talking about God, and Goliath never mentions God. Satan was speaking through Goliath, and David knew it, and that gave David the upper hand. Do you see the enemy when he speaks to you through somebody at work, through somebody at home, or even somebody sitting next to you at church? Do you remember Peter? tried to rebuke Jesus from going to the cross. And what did Jesus do? Jesus would have none of it. Jesus didn't debate Peter. He didn't argue with Peter. He looked right through Peter and he said, get thee behind me, Satan, because he saw Satan speaking to Peter, uh, making him move his lips. And so when you can see the enemy behind you, now listen, if you're at work and you probably know that you're going to get fired anyway, you can just tell your boss, hey, get thee behind me, <laughs> Satan. <laughs> if they give you any gruff, say, well, the pastor told me to say that. <laughs> but when you're hearing words, recognize where they're coming from. Because if you don't recognize where they're coming from, you're apt to receive it. It's easy to block out words from an enemy, but if you're getting words of doubt and fear from a friend, 
it may be an open door for the enemy to get in. That's exactly what uh, Satan was trying to do with Peter. He was tight with Jesus. He thought he could slip something in and create fear and doubt in his heart. And so we go on. David knew that the Philistine, that he was created by God. And since he was created by, by God, God could take him out. God had the power to take him out. When he started hearing uh, words of faith from God and started speaking those words of faith, you don't know who's going to be listening. But I want to tell you, you'll get everybody's attention. You'll get God's attention. You'll get the demonic realm's attention. And you will get people's attention when you are speaking words of faith. Go down to verse 31, and this is what it says. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. Out of the entire army, there could have been 30, 40, 50,000 men there. And there was only one guy who was saying, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And somebody said, wow, this guy's not afraid of Goliath. I need to let the king know that. He goes and he says, hey, we found somebody who's not afraid of the giant. He says, well, go get him and bring him to me. I want to tell you, that was not an accident. That was a divine appointment. The words that you are speaking are being heard in the heavenlies, and they'll be heard by the people who need to receive it. Make sure that we speak words of faith, that we hear from God. And so he comes, and he's before the king, and listen to what the king says. Uh, it says, when David's, uh, what David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Now I want to tell you, before you actually get to the battle... There's going to probably be a lot of battles before you get to the battle that you're fighting. Listen to what Saul says. He says, Saul replied, you are not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy. And he has been a fighting man from his youth. I want to tell you, for 90% of the people, for me, that would have knocked me out. I'm telling you, if I was 16 years old, 15 years old, and, uh, you know, all, there's thousands and thousands of, you know, veteran soldiers and everything else, and I get brought before the king, you know, that peer pressure, and he's looking me over and he's saying, man, you can't go fight this battle. You're too small. There's no way that you could win. You know, I would be apt to receive, well, yeah, I guess I was just a little over my head. I guess I was just had these big dreams and uh, just walked away and never went and fought the battle. He could have easily been persuaded by Saul. But what was Saul being persuaded by? It tells us there again in verse 8. And all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Excuse me. Saul and all the Israelites. Saul was just as dismayed and terrified as the rest of the army. And so what was he speaking to David? He was speaking his fears. He was speaking the words of terror that was in his heart that, hey, there's no way that you can win this battle. And so like Peter, the enemy was using King Saul, and it would have been hard for David to be able to overcome that. It takes faith to see the real battle. David does not give in even to the words of King Saul. His faith is so rock solid. His belief in God cannot be shaken. And for many of us, as we go out into the world, we need to have that faith that will not be shaken because it's going to be tested, it's going to be tried, it's going to be put under the fire. People are going to make fun of you. They're going to try and get into your skin to have you receive words of doubt and destroy you. But listen to what David says. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear comes and carries off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair and struck it and killed it. Your servant 
has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Do you see where his trust is in? Not in himself, but he recognizes that this guy is blaspheming God Almighty. And since he's defied him, God will destroy him. The paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will, uh, who, uh, will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine, the God who uh, delivered me from this. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. You know what just took place? As David was speaking words of faith, Saul began to receive those words of faith in his heart. In this passage, Saul was, the Bible said, old and well advanced in years. In his younger days, 40 years before, when he became king, he was like David. The Spirit of God came upon him, and he actually went and fought the Philistines. And as David is speaking, Saul is now hearing those words of faith, and his response is, Go, and the Lord be with you. He had already won his first convert, King Saul. And now he's going to get ready and go to the battle. David's testimony touched the king's heart and infused him with faith. Every day of David's life was preparing him for this moment. Don't miss that. Every day of your life is preparing you for a moment down the road, for a battle down the road that you have not faced yet. When David was fighting the lion and the bear, God was preparing him. He was giving him victory through faith that was one day going to fight a giant by the name of Goliath. David had absolutely no intention that day of fighting Goliath. He came with supplies for his brothers. He came on a different errand, but God had a divine appointment for him. And if we win the battles every day, there are little battles that are going to come against us to try and get our eyes off the Lord, to get our eyes on the flesh, to get our eyes on pride and other things. Those battles we have to win every day because as we win those battles, he's getting us ready for a bigger battle, a greater battle. This was going to be a defining battle in David's life. Isn't it amazing? Here we are. Three, four thousand years from this event happening, and everybody in the world knows the story or knows the idea behind David and Goliath. It's used in sports analogies, it's used in almost any type of analogy when there is an overwhelming giant coming against a lesser opponent. It's a David and Goliath story. This story is world famous, and it actually happened back then. And so in faith, the battle is won even before the battle has begun. David knew the, uh, that he would overcome, and eventually Goliath was going to know that outcome as well. David already knew what the outcome was, and uh, eventually Goliath was going to find out. All right, let's look at the last point, letter B here. Faith moves mountains and conquers Giants. So we pick it up here in verse 41. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and said, and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come against me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beast of the field. And so Day, uh, Goliath, did he have faith? No. Goliath had pride. He had arrogance. He thought by his own power, by his own strength, by the arm of his flesh, that he was going to wipe David out just like he did any other enemy that he came against. He was going to squash him like a, blood, a bug. And uh, the fact is, the Bible says that what? Goliath 
despised David. He thought he was so much superior to him. It's like, man, you shouldn't even be on the same battlefield with me. I can't believe they sent you out. Is that the best that you people got? Is this little boy with a stick? It's like, man, I should just go back and let the, one of the un underlings uh, take care of this guy. He said, hey, you come here, boy, and I am going to feed your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. He came in so much pride and so much arrogance. And you know the spiritual principle, right? Pride comes what? Before the fall. And he was getting ready to take a fall. He had no idea how this little man, this little boy, was going to be able to knock him out. And so let's look at verse 45. David said to the Philistine, he spoke words of faith to the armies of Israel. He spoke words of faith to King Saul. And now he's going to speak words of faith to his enemy, the adversary. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel. How many times has he said that in this last passage? He says it again and again and again because his reliance and dependence isn't upon himself, but upon God, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord and he will give all of you into our hands. Man, isn't, that, isn't that great? Doesn't that just encourage you as you hear those words come into your heart? What was David doing? Was he speaking arrogantly, pridefully? No, he was speaking prophetically. Everything that he said he was going to do would be accomplished. He would cut off the Philistine's head. The spirit of fear that was on Israel would be transferred to the Philistines and they would rush out and they would wipe out the Philistine army. They would be delivered. And just as David said, the whole world today is going to know that it's not by might or by power, but it's by thy spirit, says the Lord thy host, uh, of hosts who delivers. And so all of that came to pass. And so now the battle beca uh, begins. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Hey, David wasn't af uh, afraid of the challenge. He ran up just as quickly as he was coming at him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the head, on the forehead. The stone sunk into the forehead, and he fell face down to the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Now, what is Goliath? He's got all of this armor from head to toe, his uh, legs, his body. He's got an armor bearer. He's got all of this stuff around him. He's got a shield. David fires that sling, and where does it go? To the only open spot under his helmet, and it sank into his forehead. I mean, just like a rifle. It just knocked him down. It didn't just hit him, but it sank into his forehead, and he went straight down, and he was killed by God through David, using that sling by faith. That's how it happened. It was a perfect shot. And, uh, you know, that is the pattern of how God works in our lives. And that is not only for our lives, but also for the life of the nation. The fact that you are sitting here today in this country is a miracle that few people really know. That uh, David and Goliath story of America. Let's look at that. There's a the picture there of George Washington. 
um, in the snow, getting ready at Valley Forge uh, for a battle. If you knew all the stories behind what God did to make America the nation that it is today, it is a nothing short of a David and Goliath story. Like David, who fought the lions and the bears, Washington uh, had his own adventures where God miraculously delivered him. One of the phrases that you hear from George Washington time and time again is divine providence, how providence spared him. One of the most famous stories um, of Washington's adventures, and it used to be in all the history books up until the 1940s, was uh, the story of George Washington Uh, in the French and Indian War, who was caught in a crossfire. He had hundreds of men with him, and by the end of this battle, they were ambushed. Uh, Only a few of them escaped. George Washington was one of them. He was on a horse, and that horse was shot out from under him. He got off that. He leapt onto another horse. Gunpowder was all in his hair. His coat and his clothes were uh, shot with uh, bullets. And yet his hat was shot off and gunpowder was all in his hair and he escaped without a scratch. And he realized that that was divine providence. There was no way that he shouldn't have been killed in that battle with the other hundreds of uh, soldiers that died that day. And he realized that that was divine providence by God, that he had something bigger for him. And the fact is, the Indian chief, who was a part of the uh, enemy's attack on them, eventually said somewhere in the battle, stop shooting at the guy on the white horse, the gods won't let him die. And so uh, literally, he escaped without a scratch, even though when he took off his coat, there were uh, those little musket uh, balls, and there was stuff in his hair, his, his uh, hat was shut off, all of these things. God divinely spared George Washington because he had a providential plan for him. Against all odds, winning the Revolutionary War against the best trained, equipped army in the world. George Washington had a ragtag army. They didn't have hardly any funding. Congress was broke. They had very little ammunition. He writes in one of the battles that uh, if the enemy had not left the city, they did not have enough ammunition to attack the uh, Redcoats, to attack the British. If If the British had attacked them, they would have all been captured or killed because they didn't have enough ammunition, but they decide to leave the city instead of fighting in the battle. On and on those stories goes, uh, miraculous ways that God delivered them. It was divine providence that gave him, that gave us this country that we live in today. Every aspect of David and Goliath's story was fulfilled in the founding of this story. In this picture here at Valley Forge, uh, there was an eyewitness, this guy, a guy by the name of Isaac Potts, uh, saw George Washington as he happened to be traveling through the woods, that he was deep in prayer and fervently praying. Here's a guy who's realizing that if God doesn't come through, we're not going to win this war. And we don't win this war. We don't have the nation that we have today. We don't have the freedoms that we enjoy today. All the things that would transpire over the next couple hundred years wasn't going to happen unless they won. And so George Washington is fervently in prayer. And Isaac Potts, who said he was against the war at first, after hearing George Washington's prayer and the fervency, he realized that this was something from God, and he changed his mind. And so words of faith, prayers of faith, it changes the spiritual atmosphere around us. Is there really a battle that you cannot overcome with God? Do you have major problems, or are those major problems more great opportunities instead for God to be glorified in your life? Amen? Let's go ahead and stand up. We're going to close here in prayer. Because all of us are going through struggles in our lives. Some of us are looking at huge mountains. And I want to tell you, you need to receive the word of faith that God is for you and not against you. 
that God can help you through any situation. As a matter of fact, the less that you have, the greater the opportunity for God to be glorified through it. Every miracle comes because it's something that we cannot do in ourselves, but in the end it will glorify God because He has brought us through. Only God can get the glory for it. So you may be going through an overwhelming problem in your life right now. It is an opportunity for a miracle of God to come. Amen? Amen. 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 If you need prayer today, I'm going to ask you uh, to come forward. Caesar and Yolanda, if you'll come and you'll help me uh, pray. Don't miss this opportunity.